what's a, what a warm welcome. Thank you. Are you having a good afternoon? Nice, nice. Well, I'm going to sweep with a really broad brush here, and I'm going to assume that most of the people in this room today are like me, well-intentioned, and that if we knew that we were harming people in our community so they could not live a valued life, we would want to change that. What if I told you that there's many people in this room that do that every day, unintentionally? We call it normal and we justify it. I'm talking about ableism. Have you ever heard of ableism before? Some yes, some no, good, good. Most people have never heard of ableism. And I think that's because it's so pervasive in our society, it's so embedded that it's sometimes really difficult to identify. Let me give you a definition. Ableism is the superiority of able-bodied, able-minded people over people with bodies and minds that fall outside of the definition that we consider normal. Now, when I say disabled, I'm talking about people with physical, developmental, neurological, psychiatric, sensory disabilities. Actually, not disabilities, labels. It's society that disables the people because they're living in a society that devalues disabled lives. People with disabilities are 15% of the Canadian population. That's a big chunk. I've been working in the field of disabilities for over 30 years now, and in the last few years, I've done a lot of reading and a lot of research, particularly around disabled scholars. Academics like Fiona Kamari Campbell, uh, Simi Linton, Tom Shakespeare, and the like. These are folks that were there, and folks and other advocates, that were there in the 60s and the 70s when the disability rights movement was really getting underway. These were the people that parked their wheelchairs in front of buses in a busy downtown intersection in Denver in order to be able to fight for the right to be able to access public transportation. These are the people that left their wheelchairs at the bottom of the stairs and climbed up the US Capitol in order to be able to fight for changes in policy. These are the people that fought administrations at universities in order to be able to get access to education. And these are the people that continue to fight for disabled people so that they can have the same opportunities that non-disabled people take for granted. The war cry of the disability rights movement is nothing about us without us. So I don't identify as a disabled person, and clearly I don't have a disabled person here with me on stage, so who am I to talk about disability? So I won't. I'm gonna talk about tabs and ableism. In the disability rights community, those that are proudly disabled and fight for disabled rights, they often refer to non-disabled people as tabs, temporarily able-bodied. <laughs> chew on that for a sec. What this implies is that all of us at one point or another are likely to experience disability in our life. If not us, someone we know and someone we love. Disability is part of natural human diversity and diversity is inevitable. So I want to talk to you today about two different levels of ableism. Systemic ableism, and interpersonal ableism. Regardless of the level, ableism is always political, and ableism always makes it extremely difficult for disabled people to live the lives that they are worthy of, the lives that they aspire to. Ableism is the enemy of equal access for all people. So at a systemic level, when we make decisions for a group of people, say the public, and we don't consider the disability perspective or the disability experience, we're being ableist. The best result that we can expect is limited access for disabled people. We create systems for able-bodied people, able-minded people, and then we blame disabled people for not fitting in. Based on the decision-making process that we had, We've created a binary of those that fit and those that don't. 
those that are worthy and those that are not. And then we start to believe it, that the people that don't fit, they aren't as worthy as the rest of us. Systemic ableism, we see it everywhere. We see it in education when we teach about social justice and the atrocities that we have inflicted on people. And yet the violence that we've committed against disabled people, it remains unacknowledged in the curriculum. We see it at an economic level, in consumerism. When we go into one of those big bookstores and there are shelves and shelves and shelves of books about the civil rights movement, about the feminist movement, about the LGBTQ plus movement, and possibly a book about the disability rights movement, there is a very small place for disability pride, like there are for other marginalized areas. We also see systemic ableism in the medical arena. When we devalue lives, we take away the ability for them to make decisions. We decide what we believe is their quality of life. It's this kind of ableism that has seen a 22-year-old with epilepsy or a 50-year-old with a stroke in a senior's home. It's this kind of ableism that has seen a 40-year-old have a do not resuscitate order put on their chart without their knowledge. When we look at um, a medical arena, we have to know that the ableism that is there impacts everything. This has led to institutionalization. It's led to eugenics. It's led to non-consensual sterilization. And it has led to parents killing their own children because of their ableist perspective on what the quality of life means. Who gets to decide what the quality of life is? Who? And how does this impact disabled people? Well, first of all, I'm betting they don't feel very welcome. Anytime they go out, they need to make a decision about, or at least think about, am I going to be able to access that facility or that information? If not, do I have the energy to fight to be able to access it? Knowing that most of society believes that part of their identity is a tragedy and not something to be proud of? The likelihood of increased violence limited education, limited employment, limited ability to be able to raise their income, not likely to be able to buy a home, not able to participate in the same way in society as the rest of their friends and their neighbors do. This is not about disability. This is about ableism. It's what we do. At an interpersonal level, was that a little too heavy for you? Sorry. <laughs> At an interpersonal level, um, you know, when we think about discrimination against disabled people, we typically think about language first. Is that true for you? Yeah? So I'm thinking about words like crazy, stupid, spaz, retard, gimp, lame. I'm sure you can mention many, many more. If we were to use the, that ableist language to insult a person with a disability, absolutely, we're being insensitive, no question. When we take that same ableist language, we are being insensitive when we incorporate it into our everyday conversations. I want to share with you a little bit of my TAB journey as a, a non-disabled person um, who is well-intentioned and wants to have equal access for all people in our society so that all of us can benefit. So, as Michael said, I teach in a pre-employment program for people with disabilities. And one day, a young woman, Debbie, short blonde hair, she joined me in my office. Debbie was one of my students with a developmental disability. She plunked herself down into one of my two rather uncomfortable chairs in my office facing the windows. 
we got to, you know, chit-chatting like we usually do, but before we got to the topic at hand, I noticed Debbie was really staring at something. I thought she was looking out the window. I followed her gaze, and she wasn't. She was actually looking at my bookshelf. Why do you have that book? She was accusingly pointing at a yellow book called Resumes for Dummies. Do you know that series, the dummy series? Fantastic series that tells you the basics about just about anything, right? They're all yellow. It could be, you know, real estate for dummies, iPods for dummies, taxes for dummies. You know what I'm talking about, right? Do you think I'm a dummy? No, it's just a book. They called me dummy in school and stupid. But you know which one I hated the most? Dumby. They mixed up the word dummy with my name and they called me Dumby. Debbie continued her story, telling me about how her peers had taunted her and bullied her, how she felt shame and hurt, and that she didn't belong, and that she didn't really even think she wanted to be here anymore. As she told her story, she slumped lower into her chair. She wasn't being too sensitive about a book title. She was reliving her trauma. My insides twisted as I witnessed Debbie's story and how I had inadvertently added to her grief. How many other people had been in my office, had seen that book and didn't have the courage or the generosity or maybe just the energy to tell me? How many other people's trauma had I contributed to? So that's when I began to realize that if I could recognize ableist language and change it, I could lessen the trauma in this world. I couldn't get past it. I was so embarrassed by my initial reaction to the impact of that book for Debbie. It's just a book. Like, that mattered. But I have to be gentle with myself as well. And you know what? Defensiveness is part of human nature as well. Ableism is so much a part of our culture that it seems natural, necessary, morally correct, a justifiable component of our society. Most of us are well-intentioned people that don't want to harm others, but we have inadvertently been taught how to devalue disabled lives. I want to tell you another story. We were sitting around the backyard at my place, the fire pit, friends, family, everybody having a really great time, and I was having a, a discussion with this fellow that was sitting next to me. For today, I'm going to call him Spencer. Spencer and I are having this great conversation, and at one point, he turns to me and he goes, that's so retarded. And I went, oh my gosh, did you really just say that? And then he started with the excuses. Well, I didn't mean it that way. I meant it in a positive way, like an extreme. Well, I didn't direct it at a person. There's nobody here with a disability. I know someone with a disability, and they say it all the time. Words change and evolve. Stigma doesn't change, so it just doesn't matter. I meant slow, as in fire retardant. <laughs> he actually said that. Have you heard yourself say any of those? I know, somebody said no. <laughs> I know that I certainly have. Maybe not the last one about the fire retardant, but I certainly have used some of those excuses. Discrimination against people with disabilities is not natural. It is not necessary, and it certainly is not justifiable. Well-intentioned people, we say things not meaning to discriminate, but you know what? Intention doesn't change that it still harms. If we were to identify language at an interpersonal level and change it, we could impact change, reducing ableism at a systemic level. If we change what it is that we say 
our language, it impacts our beliefs. And our beliefs will signal to others what we're willing to tolerate. Right? So I'm going to ask you to do something. If you're willing, I want you to try and recognize your own ableist language. Find an appropriate replacement and use it. What helped me, and what continues to help me, as I work through um, ableist language, is I look for a word that's connected to disability. It's being used out of context and is negative. Guess what? It's likely ableist. Most of the time, it doesn't actually even reflect what it is that I'm trying to say. I'll give you some examples. Say the word, um, well, lame. That's one that I hear a lot. I used to use it when I meant, it's less than what I was expecting. It's not fair. I don't like it. I would also use OCD when I meant, it was too organized or too detail-oriented, and you are taking too much time. But the one I'm working on right now, crazy. Anybody else who's crazy? Yeah. You know what? I'm trying to replace it with absurd, surprising, unpredictable, unexpected. There are so many other great words that explain what I'm trying to say better than the ableist language. Not only that, it takes very little energy on my part and can make a huge difference for somebody else, for a disabled person, maybe even like Debbie. So, I'm going to invite you to join me in fighting ableism. I want you to take action. I want you to choose words that will be inclusive of disabled people, words that will create space where we can all live our best lives. Thank you. <laughs>